In my mind I can see Christ the Lord of all as He prepares the great banquet hall for all that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a family reunion in glory land, and I can almost see Him standing there, robed in garments, bright and fair. See the gates of pearl swing open wide, hear them shout, Hallelujah, as they step inside, see the cripple toss, toss aside his cane, hear him shout for joy, as he walks again, see the tears wiped away, by God's own hand, at the family reunion, in glory land. I can see those who through tribulation came, see the ones who have died for His holy name, see them join in a mighty hallelujah refrain at the family They step inside, see the cripple toss, toss aside his cane, hear him shout for joy as he walks again, see the tears wiped away by God's own hand at the family reunion in glory. Tears wiped away by God's own hand at the family reunion in glory land, in glory land. Amen. All made possible by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, Why would he come and die for me? I don't Amen. know. But he did. For what earthly reason is the song? For what earthly reason would our heavenly Father send down his Son to suffer rejection? Pay for crimes he had not done. For what earthly reason would the Father let him hang on that old tree? Oh, I wept with the answer that one earthly reason was me. I was the reason that one earthly reason I was the guilty He was the sacrifice
dying while I go free That one earthly reason was me Well, the fairest of angels were not summoned from the throne up in the sky oh, to purchase my pardon. Not even the angels could die. And the only provision for my freedom was destined to be the sweet lamb of glory and his only reason was me I was the reason that one earthly reason I was the gift was the sacrifice I was the taker He was the giver Dying while I go free That one earth reason was me. I was the taker, and he was the giver. Dying while I go free, that one earth reason his only reason was me don't you just thank God for dying on the cross for us we don't deserve it but he did it anyway listen up as brother Rob comes to preach to us today the most important thing in the world is the preaching of the cross Thank you, brother. We, I appreciate that, and I'd like to thank you, uh, Liberty Baptist, for allowing my wife and I the privilege to be with you today. Uh, a lot of you we know, uh, many of you don't know who we are. We uh, quickly, I was uh, saved on May the 15th, 1984, on a Tuesday morning, about five minutes to late. Prior to that, I had given my life over to playing the wrong kind of music in the wrong kind of places for all the wrong reasons. And the Lord saw fit to work in my heart and bring conviction. And that Tuesday morning, about five minutes till eight, I pulled up to work and bowed my head in an old Ford service truck. I said, Dear God, I've lived life my way 34 years, and I blew it, and I'm sorry. If you'll save me, I'll just give myself to you. And that quick. I was washed in the blood. I got out. I looked the same, but I didn't feel quite the same. I knew something was different. I didn't know what it was. Now I understand what it was. That burden of sin had been lifted. And forgive me. I'm glad that what we sing about today, the salvation in Jesus Christ is more than a creed. It's more than a group of practices. It's a living person who moves in and indwells us on the inside. And I'm going to share with you quickly this morning. We, as you know, this was our home church. I was saved on a Tuesday. And because of this church's involvement in our home, in our life, through door knocking, which usually didn't go too well, but they kept coming, we knew where we needed to come that first Sunday. Got saved on Tuesday. We knew Sunday morning we needed to be right here. So we came, and for I don't know how many years, sat right where Brother Stokes is sitting. That was our spot, we thought. Then the Lord called us out. We had the privilege of being in ministry uh, up in Forest Park for three years and then came back here 
served on staff here for seven years, and the Lord called us to start Lighthouse Baptist Church in Jackson, Georgia. So we started with my wife, myself, one other couple, and uh, we served the Lord there, and God blessed mightily. We've been able to build our own building and purchase more property, another house, and adjoining uh, facilities there. God's blessed and saved a lot of souls and changed a lot of lives. And then about the middle of last year, God started working in my heart uh, to move on. And uh, I thought, Lord, that's, uh, I'm not, I'm not a, a quitter. And the Lord began to direct me to study the life of Elijah. And, you know, the Lord would use Elijah here and then say, okay, I need you to leave here and go over here. And I began to realize, folks, that the Lord was leading me to step aside. Folks say, well, is, what's the problem? There is no problem. And uh, somebody said, well, why did you leave? I said, the best way I know to tell you is this. It's not a decision I made. It's a step of obedience that I surrendered to. And so we're friends. We, uh, I love the church, love the people. And they come to find out, boy, God's good. About the time in January, God started really tearing my heart up about not being obedient to him. I went to our deacons, and I resigned. They said, no, 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 they talked me out of it, so I stayed. Come to find out just a few weeks ago, the number one candidate the church has looked at is a young man who back in January went to his pastor. He's a full-time youth pastor at a good independent church out in Lilburn. He said, Pastor, I believe God's called me to pastor a church somewhere. And so we see God working on both ends and seems to be bringing things together. And you know what I say? To God be the glory. God knows what he's doing. Amen. I'm glad we serve a living Savior, a risen Savior, a loving Savior. And he's with us today. Turn with me quickly, if you would, to John chapter 17. Uh, you know, in, in, at Lighthouse Baptist and here's in other places, we maintain prayer chains. Uh, email prayer chains, a prayer list for Wednesday night services, prayer requests we take in Sunday school, in prayer meetings, uh, Sunday services. Yet, yeah, all of our prayers, though they're vital and needful, they pale in comparison to one specific prayer I'd like to look at this morning, that the Lord Jesus Christ prayed for every Christian everyone who would ever accept him. Now, this is an unusual portion of Scripture. It's the only message I've ever done out of John chapter 17, but I believe the Lord showed me this a while back, and I wanted to share this. The Holy Spirit reveals to us that the Lord Jesus, now his, his ministry from heaven is the continual intercessory prayer for his saints. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, to come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It does me good to know Jesus is praying in intercessory prayer for me. What was it he told Peter? He said, he said Peter, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. He said, and when thou art converted, strengthen that brethren. My friend, today, if you're a born-again Christian, Jesus Christ is praying an intercessory prayer for you. You don't walk through a day of your life without being prayed for by the very Son of God. But today, let's take just a minute and focus just for a minute. The Word of God reveals something else. The Lord Jesus offered a powerful prayer for His saints. Now, listen to me today. My friend, if you're not saved, you need to be born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. I'm reminded of Flame 96. Uh, the Olympics were here in town, and we stood uh, all week, and we handed out gospel tracts in front between the two stadiums at that time during the Olympic venues, and one lady really chewed me out. I, I don't know if you remember, Roger. She stopped, and she said, you narrow-minded Baptist, you think there's only one way to heaven. She said, there's many ways to heaven, and she began to name all these things, and she said, and we're, it's up to us to choose the way we desire to go to heaven. I said, that's not what the Bible says. Said, What's the Bible got to do with anything? You know what, my friends? We need to plant our feet firmly in the Word of God. And this morning, we'll see just a couple of things here. Look with me, if you would. 
I want you to be saved if you're not. But my friend, if you're saved today, I want you to be encouraged. When you fill another pastor's pulpit, pulpit, you want to be careful not to deal with pastoral issues or things that would be his ministry. I want to be a help. I want to be a blessing and encouragement. I want to point people to the only one who can make a difference, and that's Jesus Christ, our life-changing Savior. John chapter 17, we see an insight into the love, the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 17, if you would, look with me first of all in verse number 3. And this is eternal life. I mean, we don't have to, well, what is eternal life? This is eternal life, what? That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And then if you'd go with me, please, to the same chapter, verse number 20, as Jesus uh, labors in intercessory prayer for the saints, for his disciples there. But listen carefully and, and let the wording uh, grab our hearts. Jesus said to his Father in prayer, Neither pray I for these alone, speaking there of his, his disciples present. He said, But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, if I understand my Bible right, that's me and that's you. When I got saved back in 1984, I knew enough Bible to know that Jesus said you must be born again. I knew enough that Jesus said repent. Friends, we don't add Jesus as an addition to our agenda. We turn from what we are and have been to a brand new life in Jesus Christ. This old honky-tonk musician, I was sick of what I had done. I was sick of what I was. And I told God, if you'll save me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. And that little imp on my shoulder was up here. Well, you've got to give up this habit. You've got to give up this vice. You've got to give up. You gotta... All I knew in my heart was I'll do whatever it takes. I wanted a new direction. That's repentance in Jesus Christ. A turn from doing what I've always done to go walking away from that toward the blessed Savior. What a life-changing experience. And it changed my life that day. I heard an evangelist on TV, on radios, make the statement. He said, I know that people say Christ lives in Christians, but he said, that's just not true. Well, I would beg to differ with that. If Christ didn't live within me, I'd be finding me something else. Amen. Christ liveth in me. The problem we run into is Galatians 2.20, the first five verses. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Aren't you glad today? When we turn in this old sin-laden life and just lay it at the cross of Calvary, receive Jesus and walk off forgiven of our sins, that the Lord of glory dwells within. Oh, what a wonderful promise. Look what Jesus said, if you would, with me. He said, and the glory... And the, no, I'm sorry, let me back up. Believe on me through their word that they all may be one. Notice the wording of unity here. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, and they may, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. There's the key to salvation right there. Folks, say you, God wants to save me because I'm a filthy sinner. Yes, he does. Why? So that I can ultimately be with him. It's all about oneness. And it's all about unity. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Father, would you please take this next couple of minutes. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You preach to us. Use me as your mouthpiece. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus name. Amen. A couple of quick thoughts. Number one, what we see in this prayer that Jesus prayed for every believer. Number one, he revealed that his love is without end. Notice how it goes on. What does he say? 
not only in these, but also in those which shall believe on me through their word. I'm thankful for the scriptures. Back in 1984, this same old King James Bible, these same recorded scriptures uh, God gave us way back were the same ones that convicted my heart and saved my soul. And my friend, today there is no other way to be saved except the Spirit of God acting on the Word of God and birthing new life. His love is without end. Everyone who would ever believe in Jesus as their Savior. You know, time changes a lot of things. Cars change. I can't tune up a car anymore. Used to be points, plugs, and condenser. Now you've got to have a computer before you can even diagnose it. But one thing doesn't change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. And you can take it to the bank that eons of, through eternity, the Word of God and the Son of God will be the same as they are today. And I encourage you, two things live forever. The Word of God and the souls of men. Are you saved? Are you saved today? Not only did Jesus pray for his disciples of the day, but all of us that would be saved. Boy, to, be, to do what? To become one with the Father, the Son, and with every other believer. Boy, this clearly without doubt describes every believer today. God has a desire for us to be one with the Father, one with the Son, and one with one another. And, and folks say, well, I love brother so-and-so, but I just, can't, I just can't be friends with You know what? Sometimes Christians need to suck it up and just be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, let things go a little bit and love one another. Why? Because we're one in Him. This prayer reveals that His love is without end. It reveals that His love is without blemish. Why? Because verse 21 said, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And when you're one with the Father, the love that you receive is without blemish. Oh, He prayed for unity. Eight times in these scriptures, uh, He focuses on the word in, I in. Thou and me, me and you, they and us. Aren't you glad today, Brother Roger? I can, I, this rascal has helped me more than the average human being. <laughs> yeah, you. One, one night, we had had a fellowship, and it was when the gym building was under construction, and uh, Roger was cleaning, uh, hauling out garbage, and I went out and started helping him. And we talked and talked, and I said, you know, I'd like to get in the ministry someday. He told me, he said, Rob, he said, you stay transparent before the Lord. He said, you be available, you be usable, and God will guide your steps. And, I, you know, I appreciate that. Now, I might go a year, year and a half without seeing him. But the minute we get together, just like this group, he, Jim, and I, we haven't rehearsed in hmm, longer than we would like to admit. But we come together, and there's a oneness it's more than the music. It's more than the words. It's more than the guitar. It's the spirit of oneness evidenced by the working of the Holy Spirit in and through God's people. Man, I'm glad to be a part of the family of God, one with Jesus. I'm going to ask you to hold your place and turn with me quickly to John chapter 14, if you would. Just want to look at two verses. John chapter 14, verse number 28. This thing of, of oneness. They have an eye not doors, and we've had on more than one occasion down through the years. You've heard this. Well, I don't need to go to church. Me, me and God have a good thing going right here. Or I worship God in the sanctuary in my living room. Or, or I, you know, folks, we can say all that kind of stuff we want, but there is something to be said for being in the presence of the saints. The Bible calls it the fellowship of the saints, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And there's something special that happens, that oneness, when we come together. And when Christ lives within us, there will be a noticeable, discernible difference to other people. Amen. Look with me at John chapter 14, if you would, in verse number 28. Again, in a similar time frame there. I'm sorry, not 28, 23. John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, question being posed, Judas said, not a scary, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? That's a good question. Jesus said, here's how. 
If a man love me, he will keep my words. Now notice this. How do we evidence love? Oh, I bless God, I love Jesus. Well, if we do, we'll keep his word. Amen. We'll do what the Bible says. And then he says, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and notice this, and make our abode with him. Doesn't that say that, that when we love him and obey him, that the Son and the Father will make our abode with us? Now in John chapter 14, verse number 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. The word mansions and the word abode in verse 23 come from the same root word. Woo, son. So preacher, what does that say? When this old honky tonk musician got saved, God the Father and God the Son began to move in and make a mansion right here. And it began to make a difference that showed on the outside. My wife didn't know what happened to me. My children didn't know what happened to me. I had more hair at one point in my life than I've had in the last 10 years. It was on my shoulders. It was in my face. It encompassed my face. I had a beard. had all of that, all of that stuff. On, when I got saved on that Tuesday, that Friday morning, or Sunday morning, we said we're going to go to the church down at that Liberty Baptist. And I went to the bathroom and just shaved it all off and cut it all off. My kids did not know who I was. Wow. Daddy, why did you do that? And we went through the whole thing. You see, I went to work Monday and half the company passed out. I thought they were going to have to call 911 because the mouth had cleaned up because everything else. The, the, the old man was dying away and the new man was coming on the surface. Folks, what does the world need to see in Christians? They don't need to see us fussing and fuming and fighting. They need to see unity amongst the brethren, unity amongst believers. They need to see grace of God the Father and God the Son living in the hearts of God's people. What a difference it makes. We got to go to visit the White House back in the early 90s. Uh, we took a field trip to Nova Scotia, and it was a rust trip. I said, I'm going to see the White House. I went to the White House and the flag was not flying. I said, what? Oh, I'm at the White House. There's a flag pole on top. What in the world? Yeah, that, that's Rob, you know. Here comes Rob. They take the flag down. And I asked around. They said, no, when the president's out of the country, the flag comes down. And I made it a point. I said, one day I'm going to go back. And I'm going to see the White House with that flag flying because that says somebody's living in the house today. Listen to me, friends. What's wrong with Christianity today? We got too many people claiming the name, but there ain't nobody at home. The flag's not flying. There's no indication that God's people are alive and well and that the Father and the Son are making that mansion within us. Glory to God. We serve a risen Savior, a living Savior. God's love revealed, his prayer revealed that his love is without end, that his love is without blemish. Folks say, oh, preacher, I don't, God doesn't expect me to, to do anything. You know, the Bible says in Romans eleven thirty six, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. You know, folks, we as Christians are the visible manifestation of what God is doing. For his glory. And every born-again Christian is one with the Father, one with the Son. I mean, what more could we ask for? To be one with God the Father, to be one with God the Son, and to be one with people like Brother Roger. What a blessing. What a blessing. I walked in today, some of you I've known for 30 years this past May 15th was 30 years ago I got saved. So it's a little over 30 years ago I walked the aisle and stood right down there and Pastor received us, and folks shook our hands. Some of you we've known that long. Some of you I hadn't seen for years. But the minute we see each other, it's just like we were renewed right where we left. Hey, the world can't do that because we're one. We're one in Christ. We're one in the Father. We're one in each other. And that is because Jesus prayed it for us. Quickly, his prayer reveals that his love is without limit. Uh, back in John chapter... 17, verse number 22. 
The Bible says, and the glory mm, that thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. You know, God's love is a love that transforms. For sake of time, we'll not turn there, but 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's such a powerful verse. Folks say, well, Brother Rob, what changed you from what you used to be to somebody who'd preach? Jesus did. Amen? I tried to clean up my act. It didn't go very far. Because what we find, he cleans us from the inside out. But 2 Corinthians 3.18, speaking to believers, says, but we all with open face, what does that mean? Taking off our, our mask, our, our veil. Sometimes we have a, a church facade, you know. Come in, you know, argued all the way to church, and come, oh, good morning, you, you know. When we get into the Word of God, God says, I want you to take off, Rob, your facade. I know what you are. You know what you are. So let's, let's not have to work through that, Rob. Just, just open my word with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory, the glory, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image even as by the Spirit of God. Man, what a joy. Listen to me today, my friend. Young person, I was a youth pastor here for eight years, and there is nothing more wonderful than working with teenagers. A lot of reasons. One is they don't hold grudges. Amen. They're easy to get along with, and they're just point blank honest. And they can see through our insincerity that quick. But let me say this to you, young person today. The world's going to offer you all kinds of stuff. But let me tell you, God offers you his word. He says, if you come to my word and take off your facade and, and behold my glory in the word, the Holy Spirit will change you from glory to glory into the same image. Why? Because we're one in the Father, we're one in the Son, and we're one in each other. Why? Because Christ prayed it. Oh, it's a, war, it's a love that makes a difference. Christ's prayer in, in verse number 23, he said, I in them and thou in me that they may be per made perfect in one. God is working in our lives to perfect us. Let me ask you something. Today as a Christian, you're having a hard time. Remember what the Bible says. The Bible says, he that begun a good work will perform it until 2015. Now, until the day of Jesus Christ. And it says, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is working on us day in and day out when we're saved, preparing us, conforming us into his image, perfecting. And Jesus Christ prayed that for you today if you're a Christian. If you say today, well, I've never been saved, you need to not leave here before you come to an old-fashioned altar and just ask the Lord. Just come to Jesus. Man, he, he waits, he yearns, he loves. He's done all he can to make it possible for folks to be saved. And then he says, come unto me. Whoo, son, come unto me. Oh, it's a love that convinces others. The latter part of verse 23. It says that the world may no. Another place it said that the world may believe in that same scripture. Christ intends that our oneness makes believers out of a God-hating, non-believing world. We say, no, what? You know, they can, they'll refute our theology, they'll refute our arguments, but they cannot refute a changed life. Man, I got saved out of that, that place and I know time's short. I'm going to draw this to a close. But we had played one place up in, in the hateful area for three years. Uh, three nights a week for three years. Everybody knew me, man, for years, you know. Well, I got saved. And I called the club manager and said, I'm not going to be able to play anymore. What do you mean? Y'all been here? Bye, bye, bye. I said, I got saved. He said, bye. <laughs> Same thing, the Forest Park Moose Lodge and this place and that place. All it took was, well, I got saved. Bye. Took, took care of that. I don't remember what my point was, but it sure was good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, I got to interject this. In the early days, 
He said, boy, y'all got some great piano players and flute players up here. But now I've learned you have some great pianists and flautists. And I commend you, okay? I just wanted to make sure I said that. But what makes a difference to the world? You know, the first world God expects us to impact is our direct little realm of acquaintances. I had to go back and play that club up there the following Friday night after I was safe Saturday night because it was a freebie for Jerry Lewis's muscular dystrophy, a fundraiser, four hours we had to play. Same place, I've been in for three years. And we walked in that place. And that was before the next morning, the next Sunday morning, I cut my hair off and shaved. So I looked the same. But everybody knew within a minute, within just a couple of minutes of talking, something, what's the matter with you, they said. What's the matter with you? I said, well, you know, I started praying. Our drummer said, oh, you got saved, didn't you? I said, yeah, you know about being saved? And he hung his head and said, yeah, I was saved when I was a teenager, but I got away from God. Then the bass player who thought he was Elvis Presley said, he said, yeah, I was a, a preacher once, and I came back to reality. Boy, the devil's just working on me. I thought, is this stuff really real? Listen, I tried to get out of that. I prayed, and I prayed. I had been saved since Tuesday, and this was Saturday. God, don't make me go. God, don't make me go. Please don't make me go. God made me go. Another story for another time is how God brought it to an abrupt end. We played one song, and they asked us to leave. No problem, no trouble, equipment malfunction. But it was long enough for the Holy Spirit to use me to show them I was different. And when I told them I had gotten saved, it's amazing how many, oh yeah, I was saved too, but boy, you look at their lives, there's no evidence, you know. Jesus said, Father, I in them, and them in us. And I'm going to tell you what, I wouldn't go back to that junk for all the money in the world, all the tea in China, all the fame and popularity. Would not go back. I'd rather stand up here with these guys with whom I am one in the Spirit eternally and sing about what earthly reason. One earthly reason. That reason was me. There is no joy better than the joy of Jesus. Thank God. I'm just going to stop it here because... Our time is up, but I want to say something to you. Christ's love revealed in this prayer is a love that's going to be without separation. Verse 24 said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Why? That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. 25, he said, and I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it. Why? Listen, that the love, God said, Jesus said to the Father, Father, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. I used to pick on Brother Roger. I was a new convert. He's been, say, what, 110 years? What? No, no. <laughs> And he was, he's always been like this, loving and compassionate. I've never seen him get upset. And I thought, wow. I misunderstood him for a long time. I thought, man, his, his elevator didn't go all the way to the top floor or something. <laughs> you know, I'm, I love I do. you. I do. <laughs> okay. But I've learned the love of Jesus unleashed in the human heart that gives him and his love free reign will transform that individual. So you want to be like Roger? Just get the love of Jesus. And, and, here's the thing, folks. We want to have the love of Jesus as an addition to our agenda and use it when it's convenient. He says, uh-uh. How do you know when you've got the love of God in you? When you can turn around and shake the hand that just did you evil. When you can pray for the one who intentionally wronged you. When you can come up and put your arm around the one who has been talking about you and running your name through the dirt, and you can put your arm around them, not even mention the offense and say, I love you. God bless you. 
Because that's the perfected love of which Jesus speaks. That's the perfective love, perfective love that he prays for every believer because the love of Jesus hides a multitude of sins. Perfect love casteth out fear. But that's the love that comes from the Father and through him alone when we become one in him. I'd ask you today, Listen, we, we behold him in his word now, his humanity, his word. We, we hear his spirit, but we're going to behold his glory in the clouds someday soon. He said that they may behold my glory. Roger, we're going to see him, brother. Whew. What will we do? We'll not tell him how great we did. We'll bow before him. I am so unworthy, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for allowing me to become one in you and one in the Father. I'm asking you to stand this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and I just ask you today, my friend,